Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter number 12 be our text for this morning. And uh, we'll read three verses. Uh, well, four, I guess. We'll read 7, 8, and 9, and then verse 12. So Revelation 12, verses 7, 8, and 9 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Continue our studies of doctrine, and our particularly our studies of the tribulation period, kind of picking up where we left off the last time. Now, we are at the, in our study here, uh, we're at the midway point in, 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 in the studies of the tribulation period. This will be my final message on this subject. Although we could preach for weeks on the subject. You see, right now, right now, Satan has access to heaven to accuse and to try to cause trouble. You can read that in Job 1, Zechariah 3. But in this very decisive battle which is to come, Michael and the angels that are with him are on God's side. They will fight against Satan and his fallen angels or demons on the other side. Satan is cast out of heaven in this very decisive battle. I wonder what it must be like or what it will be like for such a battle to happen. I've never been very close to a battle. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that I've never been close to a battle. However, I've been close to a lot of gunfire. I've been close to a lot of cannon roar. And I've read a lot uh, about battles and, and wars, and I'm told that the sound carries for a long, long while away. And I, I wonder if the sounds of this decisive battle between the greatest creative forces that God ever made will carry... Uh, into the places of this earth, for instance. I wonder, I wonder if there might be sounds of thunder, but no clouds in the sky. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know about that. But I do know that this will be some battle. Satan will be cast out of heaven forever ending his mission of deception and accusation against the children of God. And when this happens, there will be great celebration in heaven. 
Because what a fantastic time that will be when the accuser of the brethren is no longer has access to heaven. He's thrown out forever. But there will be great trouble in the earth. As you know, as I mentioned last time, Satan don't know the time. He doesn't know God's timetable, but he'll know something about how much time he has left when this happens. He's going to be a little upset, actually a lot upset. Because the Bible here says that he knows, in verse 12, he knoweth that he hath but a short time. You see, Satan, Satan don't know some things, but he knows a lot, and he's read some things, and I guarantee you he's read this book, I guarantee you he's studied it, and he'll know whenever he's tossed out of heaven. That he ain't got much time. And he'll go after, verse 13, when the dragon saw that he was cast in the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And the woman were given, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. She might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nurtured where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. I believe that the book of Revelation is to be taken literally, except in those places where it's obvious figurative. The serpent, the dragon, as we're already told in verse 9, is the devil, Satan. No question of that. I believe the woman that, uh, that, that, that he's talking about here is the one who brought forth the man-child, none other than Israel, brought forth Jesus Christ. See, he's no longer going to have access to heaven, so he's going to go after the people of God, God's chosen nation, Israel. As we've already looked at and studied, this is the time of Jacob's trouble. Now some folks go further into this, and they see a great eagle with wings outspread that protects Israel. And they say, what does this mean? And they say, perhaps it's the United States of America. Well, maybe so. Maybe so, but I do not know. Our relationship with Israel has been iffy over the last few years. I don't know what it will be like during the tribulation period. I don't know if we'll still be a great superpower in the earth. I don't know who will be president of the United States or even if there will be a United States of America. I don't know those things. But I can tell you what, the Lord knows that Israel will have some kind of protection Two wings of a great eagle that she may fly into the wilderness into her place. Or she's nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. So for, for a while there, she'll be protected. Now, I'll not speculate on those things, but I'm just throwing that out there that that is a possibility. So this happens midway through the tribulation period. Now... The devil has his representative here on the earth. So some things start happening very, very rapidly. Daniel chapter 9.
while you're turning there, I will say this, that as far as the United States and Israel goes, I believe one of the reasons why we've been preserved for as long as we have as a nation and as a superpower has been because of our relationship with Israel. And uh, accepting the last administration, um, Democrat and Republican have been pretty good to Israel. Um, Obama almost wrecked it. Uh, but um, but uh, I believe that that's part of the reason why this country has been spared some of, uh, some of the things that we could have faced. I really do believe that. We ought to pray that uh, God would give our leaders wisdom on dealing with Israel as God's nation. Uh, I believe that uh, they are, uh, from a secular point, our only ally in that region. And I believe from a spiritual standpoint, they are God's chosen nation. And we ought to very, very tread very, very lightly in the way that we deal with her. Daniel chapter 9, be in verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. The overspring of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto, until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So about the time, the midway point of the week, the seven years, until the end of the tribulation period. So from the middle, middle of the tribulation period till the end, now the Antichrist will break his peace pact with Israel. He'll do away with the temple worship, the sacrifices, all that, that all that good, all those good things that have been going on for about three and a half years, they'll be done away with. Not only that. As if that's not bad enough that he'll do away with those things. But he'll set himself up as God in the temple of God. That's what the Bible is talking about here when he says the abomination of desolation. It's also referred to two other times. Once by the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And so on and so forth. So, he's, he's telling them, when you see this, when you see this abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place, flee to the mountains. Uh, Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. It's a horrible, horrible time to be a Jew in those days. Horrible time to be on the earth in those days. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And verse 4. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. Who who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This Antichrist will literally go into the 
temple and set himself up as God. The wrath and judgment of God, though, from the midpoint of the tribulation period until the end, it will also become more intense. Going to a full head at the Battle of Armageddon at the end of the tribulation period when Jesus himself is revealed from heaven to destroy the armies that are on a mission to destroy Israel. These judgments that happen in that second half of the tribulation period are revealed in Revelation chapters 6 through 19. They come in the form of seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials. Now, there are some who will try to say that, that these, that this is all the wrath of Satan. The Bible is very, very clear here. If you go to Revelation chapter 16, verse 1, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of, the wrath of who? The wrath of God upon the earth. This is the wrath of God that is being poured out during the tribulation period. This is not the wrath of Satan. This is the wrath of God being poured out upon the inhabitants of the earth during those years. We won't read or study all of these judgments. We won't read all of these chapters here. But uh, just for an example, let's go to Revelation chapter 9. So we look at the intensity and the scope of what is going to happen during the tribulation period just to get a sample of this time period. In Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and upon them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God, and their foreheads. To them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. Shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. They had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings were as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. They had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Now the king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Six angels sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns before the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which hath the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. The number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, 
thousand. And I heard the number of them. Thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire, jathan, and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and other mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed, and by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, idols of gold and silver, brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. And that's just a sampling. The destruction, the wrath of God, and the depravity of man in the midst of it all. When God's wrath is poured out upon this world, unlike anything that the world has ever, ever seen, In Revelation 16 and 17, there's the judgment of the political and religious Babylon. After that happens, there'll be the gathering of Antichrist and his forces. Uh, Revelation 16 and verse 16 says, And he gathered them together into a place called, the, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. This, this gathering together of the of the forces of the world will be to do combat against Israel and against the God of Israel. Zephaniah chapter three in the book of Zephaniah. Chapter 3 and verse 8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, till the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. The assembled masses under the leadership of Antichrist will be, at that time, gathered together ready for that one final swipe, they think, to do what they've been talking about for years. What they've been wanting to do for years, they think they'll be ready to knock Israel off the face of the map. Kind of interesting how they haven't been able to do that. What other ancient group of people do you know of has been able to keep their homeland under such great odds for thousands of years? Not only keep their homeland, but their identity. All this clamoring about Israel this and Israel that and great problems Israel is. And it's just a little piece of desert in the Middle East. And yet they want to destroy it. The problem isn't with Israel. The problem is with Israel's God. The problem is with Jesus Christ. Antichrist will the influence of the devil gather all of the world's powers together. 
come from China, from Russia, from Germany. The study of the Battle of Armageddon is a very interesting study. They'll come together there. Perhaps we'll take a, another lesson and look at, at the Battle of Armageddon itself. The book of Revelation actually has four pictures of the battle. The Old Testament, the Old Testament gives several references of it as well, several prophecies. The most graphic of the references of the battle is in Revelation chapter 19. If you want to go over there. I like to study battles. I always like the most graphic of the uh, 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 of the accounts whenever it comes to a battle. Revelation 19 is the is the one Verse 11 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clean, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he should rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast... And the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast that was, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, the wrought miracles before him, with, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a, a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, with which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. What a graphic illustration of the battle that will take place there. Now there have been Thanks to the uh, Hollywood and, 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 and uh, modern technology, there have been some great scenes that have been captured in video of some horrible battles that have taken place. And, uh, and, 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 and sometimes some of those movies, you've got to watch out. You can't watch them around very young children and stuff. But uh, war is horrible. A lot of bloodshed and a lot of death and destruction. Pain and misery. This one will be worse than them all. Whenever the nations of the world go up against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When they try to make a stand against the creator of the world. How ridiculous is that? But they'll try. They will try. And their leaders, 
their leaders will be taken very early on the Antichrist and a false prophet will be cast alive in the lake of fire and those that are left to fight they'll be destroyed no talk of a burial but the birds of the air will eat of their flesh God God made everything for a reason vultures eagles all those animals that eat the things that they eat um, you know I gotta admire the way that they are Next time you see an animal at the side of the road, you see one of them ugly buzzards or turkey vultures picking at some dead flesh. Think about this. Think about think about that the next time you see you look up towards the heavens and you see the birds circling over the woods and you think well there must be a deer or something over there that's God's cleanup crew literally the angels will call them over to this valley say hey come over because we got something for you something big before the first blood is shed those birds will start circling then it'll start. And you know the worst time on earth, as I mentioned in my in my previous lessons on this subject of the tribulation period, Jesus himself said it was going to be worse than any other time. The worst time on earth will end with this battle. And it will give way to the best time on earth. When King Jesus will come to set up his, his kingdom. Because what we find out in chapter 20 is that not only, not only was the Antichrist and, and a false prophet be cast into the, to the lake of fire forever, the, 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 the devil, Satan, he's going to be chained up for a thousand years. And during that thousand year reign, the Lord Jesus Christ set up His kingdom upon this earth. Man, oh man. Talk about a great time on earth. We'll stop there. Uh, Lord willing, next time we'll look more in depth, perhaps, at... Uh, at the Battle of Armageddon, because uh, I believe that's, that in and of itself is kind of an interesting study. Um, and um, we see some of the alliances that happen, that are happening um, in our world today that are kind of shaping up to, uh, to uh, uh, but that'll lead, that'll lead to that. Like I said before, we're not looking for the Antichrist. We're not watching for Armageddon. We're not fearful for the apocalypse. But we are looking for Jesus Christ. That's the next thing that's going to come on God's prophetic calendar. The rapture of the saints when God's people will be taken out of here. But I tell you what, we ought to know what's going to happen on the rest of the calendar. We can't just stick our heads in the sand and say, well, pre-trib, post-trib, I'm just pan-trib. I just figure God will just pan it all out at the end. That's not the kind of attitude that we ought to have. God's got this all laid out for us so that we can warn others and know what to expect. The difference, whether you'll go through this or whether you won't, is Jesus Christ. Repent. 
believe in him, for he's the only hope we have. Brother, uh, Brother Ray, would you please pray for us? Father, we thank you for this day and for all your blessings. Thank you for your messages.